On today's episode... After 15 minutes of rabbit optometry, I was bored out of my mind. But it's really hard, if you're a blind man, to get four sanctified women to get in the car with you if you're doing the driving. (laughs) All kinds of tales from all kinds of tellers here on The Appleseed. It's time for The Appleseed. In each episode of the show, we bring you a couple of stories from some of our favorite storytellers. They'll entertain you and inspire you. They'll get you thinking, and it may even help your family tell your own stories. I'm Sam Payne, your host. And our first story today is from Alabama storyteller Dolores Hydock. It's about an early job she had working at, get this, an Easter Bunny factory. Now, if you've ever saved up for a purchase just out of reach, this is a story for you. If you've ever gotten a job where you didn't have a lot of creative freedom, this is a story for you. And if you've ever learned to understand the people around you with a little more empathy, this is a story for you too. Here's Dolores Hydock with a story from her youth in Reading, Pennsylvania. She calls it Easter Eyes, and it was recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. Let's join Dolores, shall we? I've had a lot of strange jobs. I have been an au pair for three little French children in Paris. I have been a house mother at a home for runaway teenagers. I have been a blues radio DJ. Um, I have taught Cajun and Zydeco dancing. I have been an adjunct professor of theater at a local college here in Birmingham. I worked in a concession stand at the ball field across the street from the house where I grew up when I was 15 years old on games when there would be, on on evenings when there would be a ball game, the concession stand would be open. And we would sell, of course, soft drinks and bags of chips and candy bars and hot dogs. Burke's best all beef franks that we did not grill, we boiled so that they would kind of blow up and explode and kind of split down the middle and you'd serve them in a hot steamed bun with a drizzle of mustard down the middle. And when I worked in that concession stand, oh, I was so crazy about this one boy. He used to sit on the top left bleacher right there on the third base line. I found it. He didn't go to my school, so I didn't really know him, but I found out that his name was Gary Schloppick. And he was so dreamy, that light brown hair, those gray-green eyes. And sometimes he would come up to the concession stand and he would slam a quarter down on the counter and say, Just a dog, no mustard. (laughs) Of course, he never even knew I was alive, which probably was just as well. Because, you know, if, if we had gotten together and it had worked out and we'd gotten married, right now my name would be Dolores Schloppick. So... But my first real paying job was working at Luden's Candy Factory, putting eyes on chocolate bunnies. (laughs) I grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania. How many of you played Monopoly and you'd get the little card, take a ride on the Reading? How many of you thought it was take a ride on the Reading? (laughs) That's the way it looks. You'd think that's the way it's pronounced. No, it's Reading, Pennsylvania, named after Reading, England the birthplace of William Penn. And when I was growing up there, Reading was home to the Reading Railroad and Luden's Candy Factory, where the cough drop was invented. Mr. William H. Luden invented the cough drop. He was the son of Dutch immigrants living there in Reading, and when he was 15 years old, he quit school because he had to start working, and he began making candy on his mother's kitchen stove. It was those that hard candy, you know, like the kind that's in a lollipop or a sour ball, hard candies that he would sell at all the businesses and homes around downtown Reading. And one day, one of his best customers didn't buy any candy, said he had this terrible cold and couldn't taste anything except the menthol drops that his pharmacist had given him. And Mr. Luden had the idea to go home and put some menthol drops right in the candy syrup. And the cough drop was born. 
In fact, there used to be a huge billboard on the main road into town that said, we started the Cold War, Ludens. <laughs> well, the cough drop was invented in 1881. But when I was a senior in high school, which, thank you very much, yes, was a few years after 1881, they were still making those cough, those cough drops there. They were still making Fifth Avenue bars. They invented the Fifth Avenue bar there. They made jelly beans and all kinds of hollow chocolate holiday specialty candies. And that's where I got my first real paying job. And it all started because of a coat. It was a spring coat, which I know would sound like a very strange article of clothing to anybody who lives in a place where it is warm most of the year. But the Pennsylvania of my childhood was not warm most of the year. Pennsylvania, when I grew up, had a range of four different seasons. We had all kinds of weather, all kinds of temperatures. And so you had a wardrobe of coats. You had the winter coat, the one that was left over from Napoleon's March on Moscow. (laughs) It was long. It was below the knees. It was not made of fleece. It was not made of polar tech. It was wool. It weighed 50 pounds dry, 75 pounds wet, (laughs) heavy enough to hold you down on icy sidewalks, give a little eight-year-old kid some traction. Then you had the all-weather coat with a zip-in lining for when the weather was a little less fierce. But then it got to be late March, early April. It's the season for daffodils and bunnies and bonnets with bows on them. You don't want to wear that drab old khaki all-weather coat. You want something with a little pizzazz to it, maybe some polka dot buttons, a little flip at the hem, something with a promise of brighter days to come. (laughs) So you had a spring coat. And that's what this coat was. It was a Saturday morning, the February of my senior year of high school. My mother and I were in town shopping. We were at Pomeroy's department store on the second floor, and I saw that coat. It was a spring coat, pale tan, so pale it was almost white. It had round, shiny, dark brown buttons. It looked like little malted milk balls marching down the front just off center. It was displayed with a dark brown silk scarf, and it was shown with a pair of chocolate brown, supple leather driving gloves. (laughs) I remember driving gloves with a snap closure at the wrist and the holes at the knuckles where you grip the steering. Oh, oh. I wanted that coat. I wanted those gloves. I looked at my mother. She said, don't even think about it. (laughs) And she gave me that look that mothers have when they are finally forced to admit to themselves just how incredibly stupid their very own child actually is. (laughs) I mean, I get it now. I mean, she wasn't being stingy. She had before many times bought me incredibly beautiful clothes. I mean, the, the green silk dress for the piano recital. The, oh, the red velvet jacket with the rhinestone buttons for the junior year Christmas dance. The orange, brown, and gold horizontally striped double knit turtleneck mini skirt with the chain belt. That... Okay, that was a major mistake, but... <laughs> When I asked her for it, she got it for me. And so when she said no to the coat, she was just being realistic. I mean, an almost white coat, hopelessly impractical, impossible to keep clean. I didn't need a new spring coat, and the gloves were out of the question. Gloves with holes in them. You want to spend good money for gloves with holes in them? (laughs) I'm sure I pouted. And she said, fine, you want the coat, you want the gloves, save up your own money and buy them. Well, I remembered seeing on the part-time jobs bulletin board outside the guidance counselor's office there at school, there was an index card indicating that Luden's Candy Factory was looking for short-term part-time help to backfill their inventory of Easter candy. And so Monday after school, I walked the nine blocks from the school to 8th and Walnut Streets to the seven-story red brick building you could smell before you could see, roasting almonds from the Fifth Avenue bars, 
sugar and menthol from the cough drops, but mostly, mostly the chocolate that went into the Santas and Valentine hearts and Easter bunnies that filled drugstore shelves all year long. I filled in the application, was told to come back the next day after school with a hairnet, and Tuesday at 3.30, I took my place on the line. (laughs) You know how they make hollow chocolate? How they get the hollow space inside? I didn't know how they did that. I'm sure now it's all way automated, but here's how they did it then. They had these metal bunny molds that had a hinge in the middle, and that hinge was attached to a long metal pole. So there's all these bunny molds on this long metal pole. And a machine would squirt melted chocolate into half of the mold. The mold would close and start spinning around the metal pole as it moved through this refrigerated chamber where the chocolate would harden on the inside of the mold. Then it would come out of their refrigerated chamber, the mold would pop open, and the bunnies would hop out on the conveyor belt. (laughs) And the woman at the top of the line had a metal-tipped cloth bag full of melted chocolate, and she would make three squirts of chocolate on the bunny to serve as a kind of glue for the candy eye, candy bow tie, and candy sprig of flowers at the bunny's feet. So squirt, squirt, squirt. Then the bunny would roll on down the line past my fellow women workers and I, all of us in our hairnets and white aprons, each of us with a big cardboard box full of candy decorations in front of us. One woman put on the bow tie, one put on the sprig of flowers. I put on the yellow and black ovals that were the eyes. Now you had to work pretty quickly to get that candy decoration out of the box and onto the bunny before the melted chocolate glue hardened. So it was box to bunny, box to bunny, box to bunny, box to bunny. After 15 minutes of rabbit optometry, I was bored out of my mind. So I started singing, not out loud, just inside my own head, singing every song I could think of, trying to make the time go faster. I finally made a deal with myself. There was one Paul Simon song that I just loved, Kathy's song, and I knew all the words to all six verses. And so the deal was I had to sing all six verses five times through before I could look at the clock again. So six verses five times through. (laughs) (laughs) 11 minutes had passed. The bunnies were in profile, so they just got one eye. But sometimes we did a run of chocolate lambs, and the lambs sit facing forward, so they get two eyes. So you could make the lambs look up or look down or look both ways. That was the creative part of the job. (laughs) I wish I could tell you that this was like some zany episode of I Love Lucy, the (laughs) hilarious chasing of runaway bunnies, lots of laughing, lots of joking, lots of chatter. It was not. (laughs) The women did not talk on the line. Box to bunny, box to bunny, box to bunny, box to bunny, box to bunny. (laughs) This was not a sitcom to them. To those women, those chocolate bunnies meant groceries on the table meant rent money for the landlady, but it meant more than that too. Those chocolate bunnies meant Easter bonnets and bicycles and baseball gloves and piano lessons for their kids. I know, that's what they talked about when we'd take a 15-minute break halfway through my four-hour shift. they talk about how excited they were about the special things they were able to bring home to their families because of that job. That's what they were working for. I was working for an impractical spring coat and a pair of gloves with holes in them. I wasn't there long. Did not take long to backfill that inventory of Easter candy, but I was there long enough to get that coat, that impractical, impossible-to-keep-clean coat that I wore until I wore it out. I loved that coat, and that job had given it to me. But that job gave me something else, too. That job gave me a look at the world through different eyes, through bunny eyes, yeah, (laughs) 
but also through the eyes of those strong women who worked hard, standing on that line eight hours a day, five days a week, more if they were lucky enough to get overtime. And now every springtime, when I see those foil rat bunnies marching down the drugstore shelves, I think about those women and how proud they were that they were keeping their families together, helping to provide not just essentials, but a little something extra too. And when I think about those women and I see those bunnies, I think about the little message, the little tiny bit of life wisdom that the spirit of those women has left tucked inside that hollow chocolate space. The lesson that other people might look at you and think you are just a $1.98 drugstore bunny. But you know, you may be the centerpiece of somebody's one and only Easter basket. So stand up straight. Keep your eyes, well, your eye open. (laughs) Don't look back. Look straight ahead. And when you can, bring a little sweetness into somebody's life. Dolores Hydock with Easter Eyes, a story recorded live in the Appleseed studio with our terrific studio audience. You know, I bet you had some memories come to mind, perhaps about getting your first paycheck and what work that paycheck was given to you for. Maybe you're looking for your first job right now. When I was a kid, my grandpa was always brainstorming get-rich-quick schemes for me and my brothers and my sister. I remember once he showed up at the house with a bunch of Xerox copies of photographs of a stained glass window that he loved in a church. And he thought maybe we could take these black and white Xerox copies and color the stained glass with colored pencils and then take them around in our red radio flyer wagon and sell them to the neighbors. Needless to say, we did not get rich quick. Truth is, my first job, real job, was at Subway making sandwiches. But I learned a lot from my grandpa and his creativity and his ideas and his idea that maybe we could make the money that we needed ourselves, even when we were kids. And Dolores Hydock just reminded me of all that. Stories have this wonderful way of sprouting like seeds and growing as the stories bring up thoughts that grow into conversations. Maybe that's why we call the show The Apple Seed. Coming up, the Reverend Robert B. Jones recorded live in the Appleseed studio. A little storytelling, a little blues, too. You won't want to miss a word or a note. That's coming up. I'm Sam Bain. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you today on the Apple Seed. A moment ago, we heard a story called Easter Eyes from Alabama storyteller Dolores Hydock. Did you know all that stuff about Reading, PA, and about the first cough drops? All that stuff, the things you learn, right? Stories can teach us our cultural history by intertwining it with the personal history that we can share in stories. That history can all come alive in that kind of storytelling. And that's what the Reverend Robert B. Jones does for us in this next performance. Now, Robert B. Jones and I, it should be said, share a fascination with the Voyager probes from the 1970s, those beautiful spacecraft that are so far from Earth now, and which both include what Americans call the Golden Record, a collection of music and soundscapes and spoken voices from Earth, all captured on a 12-inch gold-plated copper disc and then sent to space for whenever the Voyager might bump into, I don't know, an alien or two. Reverend Robert B. Jones shares the story of Blind Willie Johnson and how his music was included on that Voyager golden record. It's a story of tragedy and a story of uplift where even the sky isn't the limit. Here's a performance of Dark Was the Night, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. Robert B. Jones. (laughs) 
Von Willie used to have these women sing behind him. They were sanctified women. That meant they believed the Lord. <laughs> but it's really hard if you're a blind man to get four sanctified women to get in the car with you if you're doing the driving. <laughs> so he got that guitar, right? And his guitar was his sanctified women. And uh, he had a song that went like this. Songs called Dark Was the Night and Cold Was the Ground. And the way Blind Willie did it, he just moaned it. Mm-hmm. Ah. Took me a long time to find out that there are words to this song. You have to find the oldest Baptist hymnal you could find. And this song is about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It goes, Dark was the night, cold the ground, on this alone. Like blood ran down in agony, in agony, he prayed. Father, please move this bitter cup, if such thy secret will, if not I Content to drink it up, thy purpose, thy purpose to fulfill. When Brian Willie died, they put him in an unmarked grave. But he had spent his whole life aiming high, singing songs to heaven and to God. So it was maybe 30 years later when they were planning the Voyager and that golden record. They put Johnny Be Good on it. They put Bach and Beethoven, Brahms, those laughing children. But also on that record, they put Blind Willie Johnson moaning this song. And I guess when it comes to aiming high, you can't do too much better than the Voyager. On a warm summer night, if you're real quiet, you can hear Blind Willie moaning. That was Reverend Robert B. Jones with Dark Was the Night, a song 
recorded by blind Willie Johnson. Thanks for joining us today on The Appleseed. And thanks to Dolores Hydock and to Robert B. Jones for sharing their stories. Listening to these stories always brings up memories for me that, you know, I just can't help sharing. Where do the stories take you? And who will you take along? Our episode today was produced by Brian Tanner and Heather Bigley. Our audio engineer is Carly Wilson. Trent Horton, Natalia Reeve, Hannah Harlan, and Evie Hendricks make up the rest of the Appleseed team. You know, we love to hear from you. If you want to send us a note, you can email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, you can rate us and leave us a little review. It helps people find the show. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.